Of all the plot devices used by science fiction writers, nothing captures the imagination quite as much as the idea of time travel. It's been a favorite topic for more than a century, from the classic H.G. Wells novel The Time Machine to the campy Back to the Future movie trilogy, along with Doctor Who and the Terminator movies and countless episodes of Star Trek, and more recently, the TV series Lost and Flash Forward. It's no surprise that we're drawn to the idea of time travel. We seem to be completely at time's mercy. While we can move through the three dimensions of space more or less freely, we seem to have no freedom at all when it comes to time. No wonder we dream of escaping from time's prison. In part one of this two-part video, we'll look at the notion of time travel into the future. In part two, we'll look at the more troublesome question of traveling into the past, along with problems like the grandfather paradox and what to do about it. Just imagine what it would be like if we had the same kind of freedom to move through time that we have to move through space. Suppose we had a machine where you could just walk in and punch in some numbers on a keypad and be carried anywhere in time to any point in the past or the future. Actually, this one looks rather beat up, I'm not sure I'd trust it to make a phone call, let alone travel through the fourth dimension. But just imagine what you could do if you had a real time machine. You could go back and see a loved one who's no longer with us. You could peer into the future and see your great-great-grandchildren. Or you might be drawn to some of the pivotal moments in history. You could witness the assassination of Julius Caesar, or watch from the sidelines as the Normans battled the Saxons in 1066. Or maybe you could try to change history, to go back to Berlin in the 1930s, for example, and kill Hitler before the outbreak of World War II. We'll talk more about that in part two. The big question is, could time travel actually happen in the real world? And if so, what would the consequences be? There's a lot of physics and philosophy behind those questions. That's why, when I was writing my book, In Search of Time, I made sure to include a whole chapter on the problem of time travel. The first thing we need to get out of the way is this. If we ever do travel through time, it won't be in a machine that just sits there. That was how H.G. Wells had imagined it in his novel. But that idea doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. In his book The Time Machine, Wells imagined a machine that can move back and forth in time, but which doesn't move through space. But just think about it. The Earth is rotating about its axis as well as moving in its orbit around the Sun. Our solar system is moving through the galaxy, and even the galaxy is moving. So if you travel, say, five minutes into the future, how do you know you're not just going to materialize in deep space? It seems as though Wells imagined his machine fixed to the surface of the Earth, so that it stayed with the Earth as the planet moved. But already you can see how tricky it is to think of time as being completely separate from space. Just ten years after Wells wrote The Time Machine, Einstein came up with the first part of his theory of relativity. Einstein showed just how intimately space and time are connected. In fact, physicists now think of space and time as part of a single four-dimensional entity known as space-time. So what does Einstein's theory tell us about traveling through time? Well, to begin with, it says that any journey through time is also going to be a journey through space. So a time machine isn't going to look like a box with a funny control panel. Instead, it's going to look like a spaceship. Relativity also tells us that time travel into the future is actually pretty easy. You might be surprised to learn that future-directed time travel is not even controversial. It's actually built into Einstein's description of space and time. In fact, we all do this kind of time travel all the time to a very small degree, and the amount that you can travel into the future is limited only by your speed. Einstein's theory says that if you travel somewhere at a high speed, and then return to your starting point, you'll have aged less than you would have if you had stayed put. In other words, 
if you move quickly and then return home, you'll have traveled into the future. At everyday speeds, the effect is tiny and far too small to measure, but it would become noticeable if you approached the speed of light. The closer you get to light speed, the greater the time discrepancy. Because no human beings have ever traveled that fast, the degree of time travel that we've engaged in so far has been quite modest. The Apollo astronauts, for example, returned to Earth have engaged just a tiny amount less than their colleagues on the ground. The difference was very slight, just a few milliseconds, because their speed was so small compared to the speed of light. The current record holder for this sort of time travel is the Russian astronaut Sergei Krikalev, who spent more than 800 days in Earth orbit. Because of the time discrepancy described in Einstein's theory, Krikalev has aged about one-fiftieth of a second less than his colleagues on the ground. Of course, one-fiftieth of a second doesn't sound like much, but the magnitude of that time difference is limited only by the technology of spaceflight. In principle, an astronaut could embark on a long voyage and return to Earth to discover that many centuries had passed. For the astronaut, that would be the equivalent of traveling into the Earth's future. Let's say you want to circumnavigate the Milky Way galaxy, a trip of roughly 150,000 light years. And let's say you set off in the year 2015. Suppose you accelerate at a nice low rate, increasing your speed by just 10 meters per second each second. This is just 1g, which is equivalent to the force that gravity exerts on you every day here on Earth. But if you keep up that rate of acceleration for long enough, you will eventually reach an enormous speed. After a bit more than 11 years, you'll find that you've completed the first half of the journey. You'll have traveled 75,000 light years, and you'll be whizzing along at just under the speed of light. Now begin decelerating at the same rate. After covering another 75,000 light years, you're back home on Earth. You've completed one lap around the galaxy. But your clock is now wildly off from Earth's clocks, and your body too. To you, it will seem as though just over 23 years have passed. But on Earth, more than 150,000 years will have gone by. If you left in 2015, and you were, let's say, 20 years old at the time, you will be 43 when you return. But the year will be 152,015. It sounds incredible, but it's true. Yet, this kind of time travel is disappointing in one significant way. It doesn't allow for a return journey. Sure, the astronaut gets to see the future, but she doesn't get to go back to the time that she departed from, bringing with her the news of, say, 2060 to the world of 2015, along with 45 years worth of stock prices and Super Bowl scores. That would involve not only forward time travel, but also the more problematic issue of traveling into the past. And we'll take a closer look at that in part two. <laughs>